Oh, no man coming unto the Father except they come through. He, he is the way, oh, he is the truth, oh, he, he is, is the life. I said that he is the way, the way, the way, the truth, the truth. I said that he is the, the, way, the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I know that he is the way, the way, the way, the truth, the truth. I said that he is the way, the truth, the life. Listen to me now. No man coming unto the Father except they come through. He, he is the way, yeah. he is the truth, oh, he is the light. Listen to me. No man coming unto the Father except they come through. He, he is the way, oh, he is the truth, he is the light. I say that he is the way, the way, the, the way, way, the truth, the truth. I say that he is the way, he is the truth, oh, the light. The way, the way, the way, the way, the truth, the truth, the truth. I know that he is the, the way, the truth, the truth, the lie. And Philip asked me, said, Ooh. Lord, can you show us the Father? And that'll be enough for me. He is the way, oh. he is the truth, oh. he is the lie. And Jesus answered, Ooh. Don't you know I'm the Father? And that the Father's in me. He is the way, oh. he is the truth, he is the lie. Yeah. I say that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the light. I say he is the way, the way, the way, he is the truth, the truth. I say he is the way, the truth, the light. Oh, yes, he is. I know that he is the way, the way, the way, he is the truth. I know that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the light. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again to The Way, The Truth, and The Life podcast from Cold Springs. I hope you are having a great week. I hope you had a great worship on Sunday because that is an important part of how you really start your week well. So I hope your week has been going well. And if it hasn't been, well, rejoice. Because if you are saved in the Lord, you have every reason to be rejoicing because God has blessed us with all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And so, once again, as I said before, my name is George Boyd Jr. I'm the minister at the Cold Springs Church of Christ. So, if you are ever in the area, please come by and visit us as we are a Bible church and we do Bible things Bible ways and we call Bible things by Bible names. And so, today we have a wonderful study that we're going to kick off this week with. We are going to be kicking off this week talking about the resurrection. And where a lot of people like to talk about the resurrection, and I absolutely love the resurrection, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. But I think the one thing that we don't spend enough time talking about is the actual power of the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. And so many believers miss this thing about the power of the resurrection, what is the power of the resurrection? You know, and I don't think we examine this enough. And I talk about it quite often whenever I begin talking about the resurrection because even the demons believe, even the devil believes. They know that Jesus rose from the dead. But as believers, it's not enough for us just to know that Christ rose from the dead. But what effect did that have on our life? What effect did that have on our life? And that's one of the things that if you pay attention in the letters, especially that Paul write, even when uh, that Paul wrote, and then when you look at what Peter wrote, Jude, all of these different writers, you'll notice that they always talk about the whole issue of what the resurrection meant. And you'll notice they'll spend a lot of time. They'll always stick in the, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Well, well, why do they do that? Why do they do that by design in these arguments? I don't think we do that enough in our arguments. A lot of times when we're trying to argue, we're not contending for the faith. As Jude told us, a lot of times we're contending for positions. We're jockeying for positions. We're trying, to, um, we're trying to get across a point that we want people to do something. And so we have to be very careful in that because at the end of the day, our goal is we want to make sure 
that what we are conveying to people is the word and the will of God. That's very important. That's very important. And we have to understand, why are we doing things? What is the purpose? What is the purpose of what we're doing? You know, a lot of people, they argue about, you know, which text or worship text. And we get people who are always trying. I, I hear this, this new group of people always talking about the worship experience. This is pure nonsense stuff that people do because there is no worship experience that the Bible talks about. But what the Bible does talk about is the experience of the person's life on account of the resurrection. And even when we think about worship, where these where, where so many people miss it, a lot of people, uh, once again, they argue about it for Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 is a worship text. Well, of course it is. But they say they don't believe it is because they say it's a lifestyle text. Well, I've already debunked this whole dis discussion if you pay attention scripturally. Well, worship is a part of our lifestyle, isn't it? Isn't worship a part of our lifestyle? Because worship affects our lifestyle. And not only does worship affect our lifestyle, our lifestyle affects even how we see worship, even how we want to worship. Lifestyle and worship, they go together. And this is why you'll notice something that even Paul is going to do here as we look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a very powerful letter. Because we know that in 1 Corinthians, we know that Paul is dealing with these issues in the church of division and all these different things. But the thing that he wants to remind them of is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But not only the resurrection, but what was supposed to be the result of that resurrection. And that's why when you start looking at Corinthians, that's why when you start looking at Corinthians, it's very powerful of how Paul begins to break it down. You can kind of look at verses, or let's say chapters 5 through 12, for example. If you look at uh, uh, ver uh, chapters 5 through, and uh, let's just say 5 through 10-ish five through to 11-ish in a sense. Paul is talking about the individual expectations of the body of Christ, but functioning as one body. That we are individual believers, but we are all a part of one another. So there is an expected way we are supposed to live. And then when you kind of get into 11, 12, 13, and 14, Paul starts getting into worship. And a lot of people, oh, no, he doesn't. Yes, he does. And they're all connected. They're all interconnected. Now, watch what Paul is doing. The same thing that I explained when you look at Genesis chapter 4 when it deals with Cain and Abel. Cain, worship wasn't right, which led to his lifestyle not being right. And because his lifestyle wasn't right, his worship wasn't right. And because it, and it wasn't the fact that the worship that God had obviously commanded of them was wrong. It was the way that he was doing that worship. It was disingenuous. And when you think about Abel, Abel didn't try to please God with all kinds of elaborate worship and a whole lot of fanfare. It's obvious. He worshiped God in spirit and in truth. There is obviously a way that God had told them to worship him. And there is obviously an attitude that God expected that worship to be conducted with. Abel meant both of those. Cain didn't. Why? Well, it's simple. Because his life wasn't right with God. Cain's life wasn't right. His lifestyle wasn't right. So his worship wasn't right. And so it's no accident that when you read 1 Corinthians, it is so powerful how Paul, he leads us into, he, he goes into this whole issue of no division, goes into telling the members of the body of how they are supposed to live. Then he makes that stop in 11, 12, 13, and 14 to talk about worship because watch this, people don't get this connection. You can't disconnect worship in a person's life. You can't disconnect worship in a person's life. 
Jesus, Jesus even explains this in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, around verse 23, when he starts talking to the woman at the well. Good afternoon, Sister Clark. People don't understand. This is why I say a lot of guys, they try to, they're, they're so smart, and I don't mean this to be offensive, but some men are so smart, they're dumb. They're ignorant. They're ignorant. I shouldn't say dumb. They're ignorant. They're ignorant in they ignore facts. They ignore context. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be negative, but I had to tell a brother last night. He was telling me about a brother who had went to, went to a preaching school and now he was ready to preach. Who told, who told us when guys come out of preaching schools, they're ready to preach? Going to preaching school don't mean you have an understanding of God's word. Going to college don't mean you have a have an understanding of, of God's word. I can tell you now when I was in uh, when I was in my graduate work, I would have students sending me private messages even during class because they thought that I was a, a scholar the way I was breaking down scripture. <laughs> well, we're all scholars in a sense. We're all scholars in a sense in our study of the word of God. We're all theologians in a sense in our study of God and his word. We're, we're all theologians. The problem is we have to be careful because a lot of people have fell victim to the whole issue that Jesus faced in Mark chapter six. Well, they were astonished at his teaching. They were astonished at the miracles, but then they said, hold on a second. This is the carpenter's son. And even though we know Jesus is God in the flesh, make no mistake about it. We can have the same understanding that Jesus has as it applies to the word of God. Philippians chapter two, me and my brother, uh, uh, Jason Nicholas, we're going to break this down on Thursday. But Paul told us to have this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. What are you saying, Paul? We can have the mind of God? Yes, you can. How? Miraculously? Through the spirit of God? Well, in a sense, but how about naturally? Through the word of God. If we have an understanding and a grip on the word of God, then our lifestyle will be right. And not only will our lifestyle be right, but our worship will be right. And we won't be focusing so much on what the Bible doesn't say. And it doesn't say we can't do this. And it doesn't say we can't do that. We won't be focused on those things. People, I don't know, maybe I need to inform people. People already have a hard enough time doing what the Bible says. And so now someone wants to introduce what it doesn't say? Stop it. This is nonsense. It's ignorance. No, let's focus on what it does say. And if we focus on what it does say, our life will be right, our lifestyle will be right, and our worship will be right because those things cannot be broken up. You think about what Jesus said in John 4, 23. He says, but the hour is coming. And let me back up just a little bit. Jesus says something that is very powerful to the woman at the well. Jesus said to her in John 4, 21, he said, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship, when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, worship the father. You worship what you do not know. Well, the woman at the well thought she was worshiping what she did know. The Samaritans didn't believe in the complete Old Testament. They thought they were the chosen people of God, and so they went in particular by the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They didn't care about any of the other stuff. And so Jesus is telling her, he says, you worship what you don't know. Yes, at once upon a time, it was Mount Gerasim, but no longer. It is now in Jerusalem. He says, you worship what you do not know. How many folk do this? So many folks, they worship a God that they don't know. 
And we know they worship a God that they don't know. You know how we know? Jesus just told us something so powerful. You worship what you do not know because she was worshiping on Mount Gerizim. She was at that particular well because they thought that particular well had so much significance in their history. But watch this. Y'all ready? I'm going to break this down because I can't go all the way into it because I want to get where I'm going. But isn't it strange? When Jesus told her to go tell her husband, well, she wasn't with her husband. She was shacking up with a man. Wrong worship, wrong lifestyle, wrong lifestyle, wrong worship. You can't disconnect the two. The lifestyle will always be wrong if the worship of God is wrong. It will always be wrong. Show me a person. Who wants to do all this elaborate worship? Show me a person who always wants to praise hard and, and dancing and, and clapping and standing on pews and running around the, the show, show them to me. And then let's watch them Monday through Saturday. Let's watch them. You'll find out, like the Bible says, people, women who will have their households weighed down with sin. You'll find men who are not living their life for God, not being the men that God wants them to be, being the leaders of their home, being stand-up men in God. You will find all of these things because you cannot. And Paul is going to prove this to us in 1 Corinthians. A lot of people miss these points because they, they, they isogee. They isolate a verse. They isolate passages. And they'll try to say they're not related. Now, watch this. They have to say those verses are not related. They have to say chapters are not related. They have to say the book, the Bible is not one book, but 66 books that are actually not connected. They have to make those claims because the only way they can stand on what they're saying is they have to isolate something and make it say something that everything around it is saying that what you're saying is not true. They have to do that. This is exactly what the woman at the well was doing. But Jesus was breaking her every, he was breaking her down every which way from Sunday. Because Jesus had to tell her up front. He said, you worship what you do not know. What is he saying? You worship a God with zeal, but not knowledge. You worship a God with zeal, but not knowledge. You worship a God that you don't even have a relationship with. You're proclaiming a God who is not yet claiming you. Are we seeing this? He says you worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. Are we seeing this? Jesus, a Jew. He says for salvation is of the Jews. He says, watch this, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit, right attitude, zeal, mind, and truth. You can't worship God correctly without spirit and truth. Spirit, lowercase s, that's your disposition. That's your view. Truth. Well, where does truth come from? God's word. See, the Hebrew writer is right. See, now God speaks to us through his son. How does his son speak to us to, to speak to us today? Through his word. See, that way the Bible is the checker. The Bible is the litmus test for all Christians. For every believer, it's the litmus test. And so that's why so many folk, good afternoon, Sister Webb, so many folk, this is why they have to always bog us down with what the Bible don't say and what we can do. They have to bog us down with that. Because at the end of the day, they don't want us to worship in spirit and in truth. They want us to worship them. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. I'm telling us, it, it, it's, you, you can't separate. You cannot separate worship and lifestyle. You can't separate worship and lifestyle. And that's why it's an ignorant argument 
to say that one text is a worship text versus a lifestyle text. Because the lifestyle and the worship go together. And so it's no wonder in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Paul isn't just saying that for no reason. Paul is telling them about their worship because, hey, your worship needs to be right so that your walk can be right. You don't, you, you don't have to make this up because when you go to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 4, don't worry, I'm, I'm going somewhere. I got some slides for you also, but I'm going some places here. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to do what? Walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. He's saying something. He, he's building up a powerful argument. And it seems to be the same one he's building up every single time. That there is an expected way to live. And there is an expected way to worship. And how you live will affect your worship and how you worship will affect how you live. And those two things together will affect your destination. You can't get away from those three. You can't get away from the two because they lead to the third. Paul says, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called with all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is no way that someone is trying to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace by trying to tell us what we by trying to uh, illuminate what the Bible doesn't say. A person who is trying to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace will focus on what the Bible does say and not try to make up all this, this ignorance, this rhetoric, these conversations that we don't really need to be having. I mean, we can have them, but at the end of the day, we're, we're really discussing elementary things. Worship should be elementary to us by this time. But we're, it's still not even 2,000 years later. That's why Paul says, look, there is one body. For all of these people who want to fellowship in all of these other bodies. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord needs to understand. You don't understand the resurrection of Jesus Christ if you're divided. Oh, I'm about to go somewhere today. Because this is exactly what Paul is explaining in 1 Corinthians, whether people accept it or not. Those who understand the resurrection are unified in Christ. Because Christ didn't die for a divided body. He died for a unified body. That's why Paul says there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Please, you folk who are always talking about the spirit told you. It's strange the spirit is always telling you something that divides rather than unite. It's strange that the spirit is telling you that a text is saying something that people have understood for 2,000 years. All of a sudden, you come along and it's different. It is so strange to me that the spirit of God seems to be against itself when it's speaking through you. Stop it. One spirit, just as you were called in one hope. There's one hope and there's not many destinations. I said it on Sunday. We got to stop saying this stuff. Paul said, enter in through what? The narrow gate, not gates. Not gates. The narrow gate. We got to stop saying that, oh, there's all kinds of different ways to God. No, it's not. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. The way, definite article, meaning one way. One hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I'm just stating facts. But watch this. I'm going to take us to 1 Corinthians because I could go on and keep proving these things. But I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians because Paul is so uniform being led by the Spirit of God in his arguments, in his contending for the faith, in his encouragement. He never relents on there's one body. He never relents on one spirit. He never relents on one hope. He never relents on one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. But we got folk in the church who do. 
We got believers who do. We got preachers. We got elders. We got deacons. They relent on these things. To relent on these things, in a sense, is to be ashamed of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And neither should we. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. But not only when we think about the power of God unto salvation, but we got to understand, I'm going to be breaking this down on Sunday. It is the power of God to unite. And a lot of us, you know, we got people who got a zeal for God, but they deny the power of God. They, de they, they deny the, the uniting power of God through the word of God because they want people to follow after them rather than God. And I'm telling us, it is so powerful how Paul, for example, watch this. I'm telling you, we don't have these discussions enough. We start contending for position, contending for being right. But when do we start truly contending for the faith? The resurrection is important. And this is why whenever this time of year come around, what the world likes to call Easter and here comes Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail and all these things they do. It is the devil who has been so crafty in always polluting the clean things of God. Always mixing in something to dilute the truth of God. To pull people's focus away from what they truly should be focused on. And so when we think about Easter... Because what people are talking about is the resurrection. And I'm not here to go into a full-fledged con condemnation of any of, the, any of these things in particular. But we have to make sure that we keep the things that are holy, holy. Because if we don't keep the things that are holy, holy, then folks won't know the difference between the pure and the unpure. They won't know the difference between the holy and the unholy. And that's why so many children grow up and they're confused because they think Easter means, okay, Jesus and bunnies. When in actuality, this is exactly why Paul is starting, he deals with these issues in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, because if you're not careful, people will be worshiping God while at the same time, unbeknownst to them or even beknownst to some of them, they will also be practicing pagan worship. And we don't want to do that because that confuses people. Because then the world thinks they're no different than us, and then the church thinks they're no different than the world. And so there's no differentiation. And this is what so many guys are doing in the church today that is so wrong. They want to be in, of, and like the world so the world will like us. But at the end of the day, the world has never truly loved or liked Christianity. And this is why right now, when you look at even in our world view, it's amazing how everyone can blaspheme God. They can use God's name in vain. People can make just terrible jokes about Jesus. They, you know, they, they, they won't hardly let you say Jesus on, on television, on certain shows. They'll censor you and all of these different things. Oh, Christianity is the fault. And you can say anything you want against Christianity. Say something against any other religion. Watch what, watch what happens. Watch what happens. You, you might literally get thrown in jail. If you talk about any other religion, talk about Christianity. They'll applaud you. Talk about any other religion. They'll excoriate you. And these are, I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you is problems that Paul saw being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Paul saw these things, and he was trying to help the church to not fall prey to these things. And so Paul was always concerned about the importance of the resurrection. 
because the issue of the resurrection is it is supposed to be the foundation of our faith in a sense. It is supposed to be the reason of why we do what we do and we are who we are. Because if Christ is risen, then that means that we are risen with him because like he died for our sin, because he died for our sin, we have now died to sin. And since he has risen is at the right hand of God. And now we live here for God through Christ by the example of Christ, because we are also going to be with God. And so Paul wants to let the church of Corinth know something that I think is so beautiful because we got people who believe in once saved, always saved. Oh, I can live how I want to live. Oh, it don't matter how I worship. Oh, nothing matters. The only thing that matters is that I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I have said it in my heart. And so now I am going to be saved. So, Hey, guess what? I can live how I want to live and I'm going to heaven. Well, we're going to see in this study. Paul destroys that entire mindset. Paul scorch earth on that. He goes scorched earth on that whole sentiment of anyone thinking like that. Because Paul is saying that if there is a resurrection, conditional clause meaning there is a resurrection, the question is not the resurrection. The question is us. That if there is a resurrection, then there is an expected way of living. So before I go to 1 Corinthians 15, because that's where we're going to be this whole week. I want to show you how Paul starts this letter to the Corinthians. This is why I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you. He starts it and begins it. He starts it and ends it the same way. He wants to remind them of how they even came to be the church. How did they come to be Christians? How did we get this word of God? How do you receive this spirit of God? None of this is possible without the resurrection. None of it. And so you think about it. This is why, you know, a lot of people... They love the study. You know, we always got all of these ologies, you know, ology, the study of, and then whatever that first word is, you know, that's to, that's what we're studying. You know, theo, theos in the Greek is God, and ology is the study of, so the study of God. And so when we think about all of these studies, eschatology in a sense, it's, you know, the study of the end, you know, the study of the result. But Paul is going to not only deal in eschatology, but when you're talking about the resurrection, it not only involves eschatology, but it involves protology. Protology, meaning the beginning of things. And so our eschatology is dependent upon our protology in a sense, because our eschatology is dependent upon us answering the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so this is why Paul, he's always, you know, he begins this letter and he's expressing the importance of the crucifixion and the resurrection because the crucifixion is the protology because Christ died for the sins of the world. And then those who accept the gospel of Jesus Christ and then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, then we repent, then we confess then we are baptized, and then we endure until the end. Well, none of that is possible unless Jesus dies first. And so that's why Paul, he's stressing the importance of what transpired. Because then when Jesus rose, that now that we know that he rose and we believe that he rose, then we also believe in the promises that he made. And so that's why Paul is <clears throat> really breaking this all the way down for the church of Corinth. So let's look at what he says here in the beginning of this. He says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place called on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, brothers, 
uh, uh, I'm sorry, both theirs and ours. So let's, 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 let's look at that for a moment. I'm telling us, you're always going to see these things, or at least you should see these things whenever men are talking about the word of God, whenever even women are talking about the word of God. There should always be an understanding of justification. Justification is answering the call of the gospel. That is our initial entering into God, baptism. But you can't be baptized right unless you hear right. And I'm sure you're not going to hear right unless the person who is baptizing you has heard right and has been changed by what they're trying to change you by. They must be sent in order for them to help you be who God wants you to be. Short discussion, long story. But we have to understand that there's always going to be that justification. Then there is sanctification. This is the part that people struggle with. Sanctification, the renewing of your mind. But how? Stop all of this nonsense of people saying that we get imputed righteousness, that God just puts what's right in us. Well, if that's the case, hmm, I find it to be strange that he seems to put it in us, but people won't live it out. They won't live it out nor work it out. Mm, yeah, he puts it in us, but the way he puts us in us and the way our minds are renewed is through the spirit of God, through the word of God. This is another one of those instances I tell people, you can't separate God and his word. You can't separate the spirit and the word of God. You can't do that. The spirit cannot speak to you without the word of God. The spirit is not speaking to you except through the word of God. The spirit is not speaking through you except through the word of God. That is very important. And so Paul is just saying something. See, I think we take for granted some of these things. We just rush past them. And this is why we can't get a grasp on the word of God the way we're supposed to. And so when he says who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, sanctified, that means that your mind has been renewed. You have decided to follow Jesus. You are sanctified and still being sanctified. And it's very obvious in the, in the case of the Corinthians. Because even in their sanctification, they seem to have forgotten. And in a lot of cases, it don't be forgetting, it be ignoring. Because the problem becomes, the moment you become divided behind people, the moment you become divided in doctrine, the moment you become divided even in opinion about the word of God, it's dangerous because then you, in a sense, almost, it's like the resurrection didn't mean anything to you. Because why? You're doing everything in opposition of the resurrection. Division is in opposition of the resurrection. That's why we should do everything to keep the unity of the spirit because we don't get the spirit without the resurrection. We don't get the word without the resurrection. So to go against the word and the spirit of God is in a sense to almost deny the resurrection or, or, or deny the power of the resurrection to change your mind in the eyes of God. Paul says, look, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ or by Christ Jesus. And I think this is important again. See, Paul is saying something. People don't get these contextual issues. Grace does not originate with man. Grace originates from God. And it's God's grace that we should be seeking to stay within not the grace of certain men, but the grace of God. And so just pay attention to what he's doing here that is so powerful. He's taking them back. He's using protology 
He's telling them that your beginning is with God. Your beginning is on account of what Christ did. And so if your beginning, if your existence, if your being is, if it begins with God, if it begins with what Christ did, if it begins with the resurrection, not only should your ending be on account of the resurrection, but I want you to understand something, church at Corinth. Your time on earth is not a waiting room. A waiting room where you kick your feet up. Where you lean back in your chair. Where you sit on your hands. Where you just say, eat, drink, and be merry. That is not what we are doing. That you're caught in between something. Let's think about this. We're caught in between something. We're caught in between a beginning and an ending. And the ending is determined by what do you do in the middle? What do you do in the middle? What does your life look like? What does your worship look like? Because if your worship and your life looks right, if your entire lifestyle, as people try to argue about, is right, well, you're going to the right place. You're going to the right place. But Paul is saying, how can you have a great beginning, but you have a terrible in-between? And we're not talking about Trials and tribulations, as in maybe you are not financially stable as you want to be, or maybe your health is not what you want it to be. Maybe your job situations are not what you want them to be. No, we're not talking about that being terrible, because even in those things, those things may not necessarily be as terrible as you make them, because if heaven is your home, then you still keep living for God no matter what your circumstance is. Because guess what? Your circumstance does not change your destination. Your destination changes your circumstance. Your destination changes how you respond in your circumstance, how you live in your circumstance. Your beginning and your ending ought to have a profound effect on your in-between. Your in-between is your life. You think about what happens when we die. People eulogize us. And in that eulogy, I'm telling you, and people don't always appropriately eulogize people. We know they only want to talk about the good. They never talk about the bad. But when we stand before God, it's not just the birth and the death. God is going to deal with the dash. We're going to give an answer for the things that we did in the body. That's our life. That's what Paul is dealing with. I have to tell you, your protology and your eschatology, so that your life will be right, so that your life will be right in God. That is important. And that's why he's breaking this down for them. He says, look, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Are we seeing this? The testimony of Christ is confirmed in us. The knowledge, the utterance. The faith that comes by hearing. The things that Jesus did. All of those things. The things that Jesus said is confirmed in us. When Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my my church. We are the confirmation of that. At least we're supposed to be. We're the confirmation of that. In our walk. And our walk consists of, to walk worthy, consists of your everyday life and your worship because your everyday life affects your worship and your worship affects your everyday life. How you see God, 
how you revere God will determine how you revere God in everything you do. But if you don't revere God and you loosey goosey and everything, it shows in your life. This is why we have Christians running around drinking and smoking and cursing and fornicating and promoting uh, homosexuality today. This is why. They do anything they want to do in worship and they do anything they want to do in their everyday life. It's their entire lifestyle. It's not just one part. It's all of it. And this is why Paul is trying to help them. Because he sees something that is wrong with them. Because watch what he does. See, I, I tell my brother Jason Nicholas, see, when we help people, the one thing we have to work on doing a great job of is painting them in the proverbial corner. We paint people in the proverbial corner. We don't give them the excuses. We don't give them the outs. That's what the world does. That's the new psychology and therapy of the world. Oh, you have a reason to be doing this. You have a reason to be feeling like this. I heard a preacher have the audacity to say we have a reason to be mad when there was this, this thing that happened in the world. I won't even go into it because I don't want to get your minds sidetracked. But he said we. You know who he was talking about? He wasn't talking about the church. He was talking about black folk. What? You're a Christian. And you're judging by the flesh rather than by the spirit. This is what happens when men and women don't understand the resurrection. The resurrection was not for black folk. The resurrection was not for white folk. The resurrection was not for Mexican folk, green folk, yellow folk, plant folk. The resurrection is for all who will respond. All who will respond. And so how Paul is painted them into the proverbial corner, pay attention to what he's doing. Now, see, y'all are doing some things that are not right. But you don't really have the excuse. You don't really have the out to do wrong. Why? Because God has given you everything that you need to do right. You were enriched in everything. Are we seeing this? We don't serve a God. These folks running around. I'm telling you, I'm not buying into these Christians who say, oh, well, we are merely humans. No one's perfect. You're saying stuff that the word of God doesn't say. We give people excuses to sin. Paul is saying something. I'm not giving you an excuse to sin. I'm not doing it. I'm going to give you every excuse to live your life right for God. I'm going to give you every reason to live your life right for God. And here is the reason. You were enriched in everything. Not by men. He's going somewhere. By him. By him. We got a group of folk who keep being enriched and enlightened by them. Y'all know folks love the pronouns these days. I'm not trying to be enriched and enlightened by the they and the them. I'm enriched by him. This is important. We have to understand where everything originates. It doesn't originate with some man's explanation. It originates with the word and the will of God because of what Jesus did, the resurrection. Paul says, so that you come short in no gift. Are we seeing this? You don't come short in no gift. And if you come short in the gift, it's because you're using the gift wrong. See, people don't understand. Paul sets these arguments up in the prologues. He sets these arguments up in the introduction. He's going places. He's going somewhere. He knows where he's going being led by the spirit of God. He knows what they're doing wrong. But he's got to paint them into the proverbial corner. See, you've been coming up short on your usage of the gift. So I got to show you something. It's not on account of Christ. It's on account of you. Because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. It's on account of you. 
He says, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who will also confirm to you, confirm you, I'm sorry, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So watch what he just said. Protology. You got it from God. Eschatology. It is being confirmed to the end. In the middle. God is giving you everything in the middle to live right. Are we seeing this? You're blameless, not because Christ died for your sins only, but because you, you are blameless because Christ died for your sins and now you are dead to sin. Oh, we see that's the power of the resurrection. That's the power. That's, that's a part of the power of the resurrection. Oh, this is beautiful. What he's telling this church at Corinth. So don't tell me you can't do right because God has given you every single tool to do right. People say no one is perfect. Why? Because they choose not to be. Perfection is not impossible. Now, if you go by a uh, perfection of the world, the world calls perfection the perfect body, the perfect chest, the, the perfect arm, the, 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 the perfect rump, the, uh, you know, the perfect foot size, hand size, you know, everything perfect, your face, your teeth, your eyes, your eyesight, everything perfect. God isn't dealing in the perfection of the body. He's dealing in the perfection of the spirit, the mind. Because God is saying something. I'm not worried about that body that you have. Because guess what? Because where you're going, you're not going to need that body. That mortality must put on immortality. We got folk who are too worried about the mortal body. And they're not concerned about the glorious immortal body. Which is where we're going to go this week. I'm going four days this week. The immortal body the glorious body that we're going to receive. And Paul, he's building this whole thing up. He's building this whole thing up. Paul says, God is faithful. Are we seeing this? Even when we're not, God is faithful. God is faithful. God's going to keep his promises. We don't have to worry about God. We just need to keep our part. He says, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. He's going somewhere because no man that you want to get behind, he didn't call you into this fellowship. So he don't get the right to dictate what fellowship is. I got mic, I got mic drop moments if y'all ain't paying attention. I got mic drop moments. Man does not call us into fellowship. God does. Just pay attention. Paul is tearing this up, whether people realize it or not. He's destroying every argument that people make today. We don't get to dictate what fellowship is. God is the originator and the dictator of fellowship. How do I know? He says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So watch this. Why is he pleading with them in the name of the Lord? Because he just told them you're in the name of the Lord. And not only are you in the name of the Lord, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And if you are in the name of the Lord, then you're going to listen to what I'm telling you, not by my own opinion, but in the name of the Lord. Are we seeing this? He says that you all speak what? The same thing. That's what the resurrection does. When we understand the resurrection, the resurrection will have us all speaking the same thing. You want to know why people are not speaking the same thing? Because they don't understand the resurrection. The resurrection was to call us all into the fellowship of his son. But I've noticed a trend in the church over the last few years. Men and women are more concerned about the friendship of one another than the fellowship of Christ and the church. It is pure insanity. 
We got folk in the church who are literally running the church based on how their family feel. I've had people in the church who wanted to literally fight me. Fight me. Because I wouldn't preach a word or let's just say I would not, I, I wouldn't refrain from preaching the word because it was offending their wife. It was offending their children. It was offending their husband. And I wasn't saying anything wrong. I'm just saying what the word of God says. But they're more concerned about their friendships. They're more concerned about their family members. And they'll destroy. I'm telling you, we got folk who will destroy entire congregations for their families and their friends. I, 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 I marvel at congregations today. We got folk, to, oh, oh, man, our church is dying. I, I, every time you step into a congregation, first I listen. You have to be like Nehemiah. First, you listen. Because they gonna, people are going to tell you when you step in, oh, let me tell you why we don't have all the members that we used to have. Oh, man, let me tell you why, man, the church. Let me tell you why, man, people don't come to church, man. People are so unfaithful, man. And people are this and people are that and people are that. I don't know what's wrong with people. You know, it's strange. Ain't nothing wrong with them, though. Then you stay in there for a moment. Then you get to observing and listening. Then you realize that there is a fellowship of believers, but then there is a friendship of folk. And the friendship of folk are ruling over the fellowship of believers. And the friendship of folk push out anybody who won't sit back and let the friendship override and rule the fellowship. And so folks say, if I can't be in fellowship with Christ, I'm out of here. A lot of the folk who say they want folk in are the very folk who keep pushing folk out. And how are they pushing folk out? Because they're not concerned about the fellowship of his son. They're concerned about the friendships and the fellowship of the folk who believe like them. Paul is breaking down something. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of Christ, that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. What's so hard about that? It must be utmost difficult for many. And we know why it's difficult. We know why it's difficult. I have watched it. I have watched it happen over and over and over. We got a certain... We got certain preachers in our, in our brotherhood, and I've been saying this for years. They built fans rather than disciples. They built fans. And I'm going to tell you something. I almost fell for it. There is a couple of preachers that I was a huge fan of. I mean huge fan. I look for every sermon. Every sermon I looked for, watched every sermon, hoping and praying for the day to meet some of these, uh, some of these guys. I'm like, man, you know what, man, these, these guys here, boy, they're, they're different. They were preaching the word of God and they were preaching it hard. But over time, I noticed something. They started craving the bigger crowds and the limelight. And I started noticing slowly but surely they were going away from the word of God. Slowly but surely they were, they were offending the long-time believers because all the long-time believers are wrong. Only the new guys, only the newly schooled guys, only those people are right. And before you know it, these people started dividing the body of Christ, and we're looking at it right now. Always making an argument about what something doesn't say. But I don't always, I'm not always looking at the argument they're making. See, I like to go a little bit deeper into situations when it comes to things that people do in the church. I like to go into why they're doing it. I want to know, as I said before, I want to know who their friends, I want to know who their family is. I even want to know who their enemies are if possible. 
I want to know what schools they attended. I want to know these things because it will show you motive. And in a lot of cases, they're trying to justify someone who has not been justified because they want to be friends and they want to benefit from the friendship of that person. Don't let people fool you. Folk gravitate towards the things that let them do what they want to do and be what they want to be rather than what God wants them to be. This next sentence, this next verse is where Paul just breaks it all the way down. He says, for it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household. I'm sick of brethren saying these types of sentences. Oh, uh, bro, brother, so-and-so, why are you worried about what's going on in our congregation? Why don't you worry about what's going on in your congregation? Because what we do in our congregation is not your business. Where do you get this nonsense from? Where do you get this nonsense from? We see this too much in the Bible. See, these young, be, these young boys, these young, these young men today, these young men and women today, they got a code. It's the dumbest code I ever heard of. Don't be a snitch. Now, I want you to understand. And, and, and the thing that really makes me the angriest, and I'm not going to get off into this tangent, but why do they spread this in particular in? <laughs> why do they spread this in particular amongst the black community? This code of don't be snitches that you would rather go to jail than to tell on somebody who committed a crime. And don't tell on somebody who committed a crime now because snitches get stitches. And if you were a part of a crime, you don't tell on anybody who was a part of the crime. You go and do the time for everybody who committed the crime and let them continue to be criminals. And when you get home, they're going to have you a bag waiting. You get home, you see what they're going to have waiting on you. They're going to be poor and destitute. They're not going to have anything for you. We create these dumb codes. And we do the same dumb stuff in the church. It's not your business what we're doing over here. How come it's not? How come it's not my business what you're doing at your congregation? Because we are one body. And if one part of the body is suffering, the entire body is suffering. You ever stomped your toe? Isn't it strange? Isn't it strange when you stub your baby toe, your whole body collapse? Isn't it strange if you got back pain, your whole body can't get up? Don't tell me it don't matter. Paul didn't say, I heard from a little birdie. Paul said, I heard it from those of Chloe's household. Oh, I guess we would say today that Chloe's household need to mind their business. I guess when Paul tells us in the book of Romans that your faith has been spoken of all over the world, I guess Paul is saying he just got that from a little birdie. Or could it be that folk were talking about the faith of a church or churches in that area. Chloe, we know they're meeting in households and obviously they're doing what's right in Chloe's household. But Chloe is saying, but in this other household, they're not doing what's right. He says that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos or I am of Cephas or I am of Christ. Oh, we see this? Sounds like Peter when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He asked Jesus, should I build three tabernacles? Oh, uh, no, God, God, God's voice came down. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Uh, Peter, stop it. Listen to him. Did he tell you to build a tabernacle? Well, I know what these new guys will say today. Well, he didn't say we couldn't build a tabernacle. It's not about what God said. It's about what God did say. And I'm not saying it's not about what he, what he didn't say because what he didn't say should be deafening. 
There are certain areas that we know we have leeway in because the Bible doesn't speak on them, such as we get folk who try to make these grand arguments. Well, we say we do things Bible ways. Well, all the pews Bible ways, stop it. Stop this nonsense. You want to rip out the pews? Go right ahead. Put chairs in there. Oh, buildings are not. Well, the Bible doesn't talk about. Okay, go right ahead. Worship outside then. Worship outside. Other nonsense discussions. Build straw men so people can get, so they can get people distracted. No, we're not building straw men. We're in the man. We're in God. We understand what God is telling us. And Paul is saying something very powerful. He says, each of you says, well, why would some of them maybe get behind Paul? Why, why would some of them get behind Paul? Well, we know Paul, he, he's planting churches all over the place. He's even going to mention that he labored harder than all of them in, in a sense, or he labored the much more. Oh, I be of Apollos. Well, it was obvious that Apollos was a very fiery speaker. Maybe, maybe they were listening to him. Some say I be a Cephas. Isn't it strange? They don't call him Peter. They call him Cephas. That's, that's his original Jewish name. And then some say, I be of Christ. And we got to ask ourselves because we don't really have an indicator that, that Paul, we know we don't have an indicator that Paul was saying anything against God's word. We don't have an uh, issue of Apollos or, or Cephas. But I'm going to tell you what people do. I'm going to tell you exactly what people do. Sometimes people will hear something that somebody says. And then they'll start gravitating towards that person because that th they think that person is going along with the way they think. And so they'll start whole movements, entire movements behind people. But Paul is telling them, and, and this is why we have to be careful in how we pay attention because I'm a different type of preacher. I'll just say that. And some people may prefer the way I preach. But we have to be very careful. Don't get caught up in how I preach as much as what I preach. Because I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, because I, I, we're not going to play, we're not going to play games here. We, we know that there is a certain way that certain people preach that just really grab our attention. But then there may be a way that, you know, there's some people who might not like the way I preach. But at the end of the day, they have to be very careful and don't be carnal, but be spiritual. But what is he saying? But what is he saying? Because I know some guys that flat out, homiletically, or the style that they preach in is, man, woo, man. But then when you start listening to what they're saying, you're like, woo, man. This guy's saying all kinds of stuff that's not true. It's what's being said that we have to pay attention to. And that's even where Paul is going in a sense. Because it is not these men who call us in the fellowship. It's not these men who are the author and the finisher of our faith. It's not these men who you are called to follow in a sense. No. You follow them as they follow God in Christ. You listen to the words that they are preaching. And you be united in Christ because I'm sorry, we're not answering this question today. We're not asking nor answering it. Good afternoon, Sister Cook. We're not answering. We're not asking this question. Is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? Is he? Is he? The next time somebody asks you your faith, hey, what faith are you? Because you know what they want to know. Hey, what faith are you? You, you, you Methodist, you, 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 you Catholic, you know, what are you? What are you? Holy Roller, what are you? Is Christ divided? Is Christ divided? Because when, if I tell you, that I'm from, you know, the contemporary Holy Roller Church. 
So the first thing to hit your mind, okay, wait a minute, contemporary. Hmm. Probably means postmodern, postmodern, holy roller, instruments in worship. See, see what we do? See, see what we do? That's the devil. That is a denier of the resurrection. The resurrection is supposed to call us in one body in one name and not one body in a whole lot of names because it can't be one body in a whole lot of names. The one body has to have one name. I don't understand how we can't get this simplicity. Paul said, is Christ divided? Ask yourself, does a name divide? I'll wait. Does a different name divide? Hold on a second. Does a different way of worship divide? H hold on a second. Does a different biblical interpretation divide? I'll wait. There ought to be spiritually no divisions. No divisions. <coughs> Paul said, was Paul crucified for you? Hmm. Scratch out Paul. Put your favorite preacher in there. Put your favorite preacher in there. Put your quote unquote favorite pastor in there. Put your favorite friend in there. Put your mama, put your daddy, put your brother, put your sister, put your friends. Were they crucified for you? So now I got another question for you that I know Paul is implying. So why are you following them? Why are you following them? Were they crucified for you? Oh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Scratch out Paul. Put your favorite preacher in there. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't even put your, scratch out your favorite preacher. Put whatever quote unquote faith that you say you identified with when Paul said there is one faith. Now put your faith in there. Were you baptized into that faith? Were you baptized into that name? Because if I'm remembering, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Son, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't remember him saying, in the name of the elder, in the name of the preacher, the deacon, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, your mama, your daddy, this church, that church. I don't remember that being said. And the only way you can be in the name of Christ is you have to be in the word of God. There ought to be no divisions. How do I know? Speak the same thing. You can't tell me we can do this over here and we can't do it over there. That's not speaking the same thing. The only way we speak the same thing is we get it from the same place. We get it from the same spirit and the same word. There's no other way to do it. The problem is we've become so smart, we're ignorant. We're ignoring simple Bible. If Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, he's not saying this because necessarily it's not about him. He's not saying this because he didn't want them to be baptized. He's not even saying this for the argument that some people say, well, that's why the preacher shouldn't baptize or this person shouldn't. Be. He's not saying it because of that. He's saying it because of the carnality of their minds, because if he had been baptizing a whole bunch of them. They would clearly be saying, I'm baptizing the Paul. Paul baptized me. That's the best baptizer in the world. I'm going to follow everything Paul say and no one else. No, we can't do that. We can't do that. And I'm telling us it, it's, it's powerful. But I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here. I will be back tomorrow. Just tune in. We're, we're just getting started on this. We're going to go from this to 1 Corinthians 15, and it's going to be, it's going to be beautiful. So that's going to do it for me. That's going to do it for me. I, I would go longer, but I got <laughs> – we're going to continue this tomorrow. That's going to do it for me. That's going to be my time. So until the next time, may God bless you. May God keep you.
No man coming unto the Father except they come through He. He is the way. Oh, he is the truth. Oh, he, he is, is the life. I said that He is the way. The way. The way. The truth. The truth. I said that He is the way. He is the truth. 